right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming out and uh, braving the cold. And we've got some great authors tonight. We'll be doing the book drawing at the end. Uh, we'll be giving away 10 books, so we've got a pretty good chance. And without further ado, here is Jen and Greg. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, my name is Jen Beck Seymour, and this is my husband of 24 years, Greg Seymour. I grew up here in Wisconsin Rapids, and I went to Assumption High School. And we just want to thank um, McMillan for having us tonight. We're happy to be here, and thanks for coming out in the cold tonight to see us. Um, so to start with, we want to ask everyone a question. By a show of hands, how many of you have spent more than two consecutive nights in a tent in the woods? <laughs> wow, oh my gosh, okay. So all of you guys with your hands raised actually had more experience than me and my husband did before we did our hike. <laughs> yep, so in 2017, we through hiked the entire 2200 mile Appalachian Trail. Um, we went by the trail names Chica and Sunsets. And we basically lived in the woods for six months. Um, let's see. It was uh, one of the best experiences of our lives, and also it was the most challenging thing we have both ever done. Um, you may have heard of a book called Wild by Cheryl Strait about the Pacific Crest Trail, and another book called A Walk in the Woods by Bill Bryson about the Appalachian Trail. There's uh, one difference between those two hikers and us. They did not complete their thru-hike, and we did. So uh, let's define what a thru-hike is. A thru-hike is a hike of any long-distance trail within a 12-month period. So for instance, if you uh, start the trail March 1st of this year, you would need to finish it before March 1st of next year. Um, so today, we are going to talk about several different aspects of our hike. Things like, why would you want to through hike the Appalachian Trail? Um, what do we eat every day? Where do we sleep every night? How bad did we stink? <laughs> How often do we get a shower? How do we not get lost on the trail? Um, how much did our packs weigh? What kinds of animals did we see? And last but not least, how did our marriage survive? <laughs> so uh, to start with, let's start with the biggest question you might have, and that is why would you want to through hike the Appalachian Trail? So if you're ever cold and you want to get warm really fast, stand up in front of 50 people. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, like Jen said, uh, let's talk about a little bit about um, how we got to come to hike the Appalachian Trail. Uh, I'll start with a little bit of history about our lives. Um, we both had successful careers in Dallas, and um, we had basically what everybody would consider the achievement of the American dream. Uh, we had a nice house, we had two cars, uh, we had enough money to cover the bills and uh, spend uh, however we wanted to. The problem is we didn't have time. We didn't have time to use any of that. <clears throat> so uh, that compounded with my job. Uh, I was a manager for a company that uh, ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, uh, I was very stressed out. Um, it was affecting my health, and it was affecting our relationship. Uh, so something had to give. <laughs> and so we started looking at um, ways to get out of that situation. Um, and eventually, uh, we came to the idea, actually I came to the idea, uh, let's move to a foreign country. And um, a little bit about Jen and Mai's personality. I'm very much a dreamer. Uh, Jen's very pragmatic has to have everything uh, on a spreadsheet. And um, so I brought, the, I, brought the, I brought this idea to her, and, and she uh, heard it. <laughs> and, uh, but as we, as we talked about it, and as we started to uh, put 
some uh, financial figures on paper and we started to dig in, uh, we learned that we could live for less overseas. Uh, you know, one, one example, one specific, uh, 50 cent beer in Panama. I mean, you could drink a lot of beer for 50 cents a pop. Um, so, uh, after a bunch of research, we determined that we would move to Costa Rica, uh, and, and we did. And we sold everything we had except for nine suitcases of stuff and moved to Costa Rica. So here we are in Dallas, right before we left for Costa Rica with our nine suitcases. And we moved there and we lived in Costa Rica for four years. Um, and in this time, we discovered a lot about ourselves and we really worked hard at simplifying our lives. Um, we, we, found that we found ourselves relaxing a lot more and just enjoying life a lot more. And since we had more time, we discovered new passions we had. Uh, Greg got into photography. Um, we both got into writing and publishing books. And I started baking and cooking more. I went to yoga more often. And I started a jewelry business, which I still do to this day. And the biggest thing was we both got into hiking. Hiking is something we um, did together, and it soon became part of our daily life. We would uh, get up early every morning and go basically right out our back door. The area we lived in Costa Rica was very mountainous, so it was kind of like having our own natural stairmaster. <laughs> and we just found that we really liked it. We liked being out in nature. We'd see parrots and toucans flying by. And we talked and brainstormed really well about different projects we were working on. Um, so yeah, we just really found that we liked this time together, we liked hiking together, and being out in nature. So that leads us to the question, why would we want to leave paradise? So Jen just told you about this beautiful, wonderful place called Costa Rica, and we had this wonderful life where we got to do whatever we wanted to, um, whenever we wanted to, and all the time constraints we had in our working life uh, we're no longer there. Why the heck would you want to leave um, Costa Rica? Uh, good question. <laughs> uh, you know, we, in the big scheme of things, we went to Costa Rica to live, not to die. Uh, it was a way to uh, segue out of the situation uh, I was in, particularly at my job, and it, it, it had uh, served its purpose. Um, we had a great time. We immersed ourselves in the, in the culture, in the language. Uh, we met uh, Ticos, which the Costa Ricans call themselves. Um, and we had a great time. You know, Costa Rica is a small country. It's about the size of West Virginia. So in four years, we saw uh, basically everything that we wanted to see uh, about Costa Rica. And we were ready for a new adventure. Um, and like Jen was saying, we were hiking an awful lot. We were hiking six to eight miles Every, every day we lived in a mountainous area. A lot of people think of Costa Rica as all beach, uh, but we lived in what's called the Central Valley, which is a mountainous area, and so we'd go out our back door and walk through the mountains. <coughs> and we had walked six or eight miles uh, every day. And during one of these hikes, I don't know which one said it first, uh, but I'm sure it was said flippantly. Uh, someone said, let's hike the Appalachian Trail. And, um, we didn't take it really seriously, um, but as we were hiking, and, and as hiking became more of our lifestyle, um, we started considering the option of hiking this long trail uh, very seriously, so much that the planner over here uh, set up a, a, a spreadsheet for it. Uh, you know we're serious when, when a spreadsheet comes out. Um, so the, the deal was, if we could get our hike uh, with backpacks on up to a 15 mile hike, we would start planning a, a, an Appalachian Trail trip. Um, and we did. And uh, we started accumulating gear while we were in Costa Rica. We did a ton of research, uh, watching YouTube videos of other hikers uh, through hiking the Appalachian Trail. Uh, and we did a lot of research uh, reading as well. And we started accumulating this gear, uh, getting prepared uh, for our trip. So I'm going to talk about a brief overview of our gear, uh, because gear can get very detailed and specific. Um, first of all, the big, biggest three pieces of gear you have are your backpacks, 
your shelter, and your sleep system. So here you can see us with our packs on. This was us on the Appalachian Trail. And Greg's pack weighed about 30 pounds on average, and mine weighed about 27 pounds. So the guy should carry the, the most weight, right? So he <laughs> a little bit more than I did. Um, and our, our packs worked really good for us. Uh, the tent that we had, we actually had a three-person tent, and this gave us a little bit of room between each other, so we weren't like right on top of each other. And it also had two doors to the tent, so we could easily both get out without having to climb over each other. Um, and it worked pretty well for us. Our sleep system we had was, we both had an air mattress that we blew up each night, and we'd have to decompress it each morning. Um, but it made for a pretty comfortable sleep, as comfortable as you can get in the woods. Um, and we both had a sleeping quilt, which is very similar to a sleeping bag, but it, um, it can secure around your feet, but then you can also let it out so it's like a square blanket, which was helpful in the summers when it got hot, you could just toss it off. Um, other items we had were our clothing. We have a base layer, a mid layer, and an outer layer. And our favorite fabric for clothing was a material called merino wool. This was kind of a magical material. It keeps you warm in the cold weather and it cools you off in warm weather. It wicks sweat away from your skin really well and also dries really quickly. So if you get it wet, it dries very fast. Um, other things we had were a cook stove, a cook pot, and we both had our own food bags. And our food bags were probably our piece of gear that weighed the most because we would pack out between five and six days of food at a time. Um, a few other things we had were a basic first aid kit and like toothbrush, toothpaste. Things we didn't have were deodorant, soap, and shampoo. Um, so now Greg is going to talk about a few more statistics about what the Appalachian Trail is. So the Appalachian Trail is a uh, national scenic trail. Um, and here is a map showing you where it goes. It goes through 14 different eastern states. Um, starts in the south at in, in, in Georgia at a uh, mountain called Springer Mountain and ends in Maine. Uh, at, at a mountain called uh, Mount Katahdin. Uh, the, the trail, like I said, it goes uh, 2,200 miles. The year we hiked, it was 2,189.8 miles, but it changes uh, each, each year due to uh, land rights issues and reroutes and things like that. Um, to, to complete it, it takes about 5 million steps, so if you're a Fitbit person, uh, you'll get your steps in for sure every day. Um, you know, a lot of people think the when they hear the Appalachian Trail, they think of a, a nice scenic path through a forest, um, and it's 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 more like this on a day to day basis. In fact, uh, doing the twenty two hundred miles uh, is equivalent to summiting and descending Everest sixteen times. So you do this over between five and seven months. The average through hiker takes. Hikers can go uh, northbound or southbound, um, or you can actually do what's called a flip-flop. A northbound person, which is a, a no-bo, which is what we were, starts in Georgia and goes uh, north to Maine. Uh, Sobo starts in Maine, <coughs> comes back to Georgia. The advantage there is you can start later in the, in the year. Uh, a lot of students do that because they're in school and then uh, a, a southbound journey helps them achieve a later start. Or you can do what's called a flip-flop. You start anywhere within the trail, hike one direction, flip, and then hike the opposite direction. Uh, one statistic that surprises a lot of people, of all the people with the intention of hiking the entire trail in a year, only 25% of those people achieve that objective. Uh, we started northbound uh, at Springer Mountain. Here we are at Springer. Um, you can tell we're starting because our clothes are very clean. The yeah. colors are very bright. Uh, we look rested and happy. <laughs> um, so this was, it was a great first day for us. It didn't rain on the first day and that's all I was hoping for. So we got a good first day. Um, before Greg and I started the trail, we made a commitment to each other that we, this was important to us. We both wanted to finish the trail because a lot of people don't. It's very easy to quit. 
So we made a promise to each other that we weren't going to quit unless we had a severe injury, one of us had an injury, or we had a family emergency where we had to go home and be with some family. So we were determined, um, no matter how bad it got, that we would get through it and we weren't ever going to talk about quitting. And it worked well for us. We didn't quit. Um, we also started out very slowly. We built up our mileage slowly. Um, this was because a lot of people go out too fast, too soon. They get injuries um, before they know it. They have blisters, knee problems, feet problems. We started with about eight miles for the first week and slowly worked up to 16 miles <coughs> over five weeks. And it wasn't long after that where we were doing 20 mile days and that was our average day. But at the time, working up slowly like that, we felt really good once we got to the 20 miles. Um, it also didn't take us long before we became stinky hikers. Um, yeah, we stunk. Um, we would go days without a shower. Um, but one thing we did do was do what I call kind of a wet wipe bath at night before we put on our clean sleeping clothes. And that helped us to just feel better and also keep our feet clean, which is important with if you have any blisters or sores. Um, we also went into town about once a week and we'd stay at a hostel where we do laundry, take a shower, sleep in a real bed, um, resupply food, and go into town and eat as much pizza and burgers as we could. So uh, Greg is going to talk about a day in the life now of a hiker. Okay, so it should go without saying that to hike 2,200 miles, uh, your main duty every day is to hike. Uh, we were walking, hiking, um, traversing, um, trotting, uh, along for, you know, eight to 10 hours a day. Uh, and, and we slowly built our mileage up, like Jen said. Um, but outside of hiking, there are a lot of little things that happen as well. Uh, let's start uh, in the morning. In the morning, we would wake up. This is uh, us, or Jen, uh, at a campsite uh, in North Carolina. And the first thing we do is start putting things back into our backpacks. Uh, most uh, backpacks uh, for long distance hiking are top loaded. And so to get to anything, you have to take everything out. So in the evening, you explode your backpack, and in the morning, you put it all back together, uh, some more organized than others. Um, but uh, once we would do that, we would um, have breakfast. And breakfast was simple. It was Pop-Tarts and a, um, a protein bar, pretty much. No coffee. <laughs> no coffee. We, um, we did have a, a camp stove, uh, ultralight camp stove. Uh, but we wanted to conserve the fuel so we didn't have to carry so much, so we only used it in the evenings for dinner. Um, the next thing we would do, or what we would do during breakfast, is talk about the day. Where are we going to end up? Uh, where are the water sources? Uh, when do we need to gather water? And when are we going to take our breaks and eat? Uh, those are all important things. Um, and usually we had two or three different campsites as targets for the evening. Um, the first one was kind of shorter in case one of us uh, was just not feeling it that day or got injured. Uh, the other one was a little bit of a stretch. So the way the, the day went from there was uh, hike two miles, take a break. Hike two miles, take a lunch. Two miles, break, two miles, find camp and set up. Uh, each of those breaks we would stop and eat. Uh, there is just no way to fill up the amount of calories that you're burning, so you, you eat as often and as much as you can. Uh, we would usually try to find a nice overlook uh, or um, uh, a place to, to uh, eat. Uh, at night, uh, we would gather water, um, both for cooking and for uh, to start out the next day with. Uh, we would um, have dinner, which at night was like more rice sides or Idaho and potatoes, uh, anything that's very filling, uh, maybe maybe add some beef jerky for, for seasoning. Um, and then we would uh, turn in for the night, and if we had energy, we would uh, read a little bit. And I didn't show you that slide. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so I'm going to talk about a few of the things Greg just talked about, but in more detail. This is a shelter along the trail, and there are several shelters. They're probably between every 8 and 10 miles along the Appalachian Trail. They have three walls. One wall is exposed and open to the elements, has a roof, and a platform uh, floor. Um, we only stayed in a shelter to sleep maybe two times on the whole trail. Um, the reason being, lots of hikers tend to gather at the shelters, and you could wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself totally sardine right next to all these other people you don't even know. Um, snoring could be a problem. And also mice are a problem. Lots of mice live in the shelters. Uh, they tend to hang out where there's food, and where there's hikers, there's food. So that was a, we didn't want to wake up in the middle of the night and find a mouse crawling across our face. Yeah. Um, so we tended to stay in our tent, but a lot of times we would stay near shelters, and the reason being is they usually had a good water source nearby and a privy, and sometimes they had assistance with helping you hang your food bag. Um, our food bag is also called a bear bag, and you have to hang it every night so bear don't get into your food. Um, this is a very good description of how you have to hang it. And luckily, Greg would hang both of ours every night, so I was very thankful to him that he did that. It's actually um, pretty hard to do. You have to find just the right tree with a 90-degree branch coming out. The bag has to be hung 12 feet up from the ground, 5 feet away from the trunk of the tree, and 5 feet from the branch hanging down. So. It's kind of, it's more difficult than it looks even, and you have to throw the rope way over the branch, and it can take some time, right? <laughs> um, another thing we did on the trail was we would need to filter our water. Water sources were very prevalent. We never had a problem finding water. We never ran out of water, but we did have to filter it. Um, the filter we used was a Sawyer squeeze. It was just about that big. And you would just gather water, screw it on the bag that you collect your water in, and then squeeze it through the filter into a clean water bottle. It really didn't take that long, just a little bit of time, and this prevented us from having any parasites. So we always filtered our water, and we never got ill or sick, so it worked well. Okay, uh, Greg is going to talk about how we didn't get lost on the trail. So you're hiking 10 hours a day through uh, forests um, and uh, with, with, with the main goal of getting from one place to another uh, that's 2,000 miles away. How do you do it and not get lost? Um, it's actually, the Appalachian Trail is actually, uh, it would be difficult to get lost on it because there's, there's three things that you can use uh, to help navigate as you go. First off is uh, these white blazes uh, as you see on that down log, um, white blazes are uh, affixed to trees and rocks by trail maintenance groups all along the trail. And they're found from the beginning to the end. And they are, um, they make it very easy not to get lost. Um, they're, they're placed anywhere from a tenth of a mile to half of a mile uh, apart. Um, and I think there's like 22,000 along, along the trail, something like that. Uh, it's, a, it's an awful lot. Um, but they, uh, they assist greatly. One thing about the, the blazes, though, is they don't tell you which direction you're going. So um, because they're placed northbound and southbound, um, you could get turned around. That especially happens when you're leaving camp in the morning and you take a left and you should have taken a right. Um, there's other colored blazes as well. Blue is the most popular uh, or prevalent, I guess, on the AT. And a blue blaze will take you to scenic overlooks, uh, water sources. Uh, they could take you to town. Um, uh, it, it's off the trail, but it takes you somewhere. The second method we used, <coughs> excuse me, was um, was a, a guidebook called A Wall's Guide. A Wall is the trail name of a hiker that hiked many years ago. And he created this guidebook that gives you so much information. It's on that back table there. Uh, it's spiral bound if you want to take a look at it. It'll show you a mountain's elevation. 
It will show you distances between towns and campsites and water sources, um, as well as phone numbers for hostels and, and restaurants and things like that in the towns. The last method we used to keep track of where we're going is a, um, an application called Gut Hooks. Once again, Gut Hook is the trail name of a former Appalachian Trail through hiker. Um, and he created this app, and it is absolutely amazing. <laughs> it's GPS uh, enabled, so it pings off of satellites. And the great thing about, there's multiple great things about Gut Hooks, but one of the things is, um, it can tell you whether you're up to five feet off the trail. Um, it, it is that accurate. So you always know if you're on the Appalachian Trail, if say you haven't seen a, a white blaze in a long time and you look at it, um, you can tell where you're at. Uh, it also gives you a lot of elevation information, which we started not to look at because <coughs> it was kind of depressing <laughs> to see what we had to climb each day. But this is an example of uh, a couple mountains in Georgia. You can see uh, the, 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 uh, the the blue dot is water, um, the brown dot is a shelter, uh, this other purple dot is, is sleeping accommodations, so there's a town there. Uh, and if you look at the top left, it'll show you uh, this 16 and a half mile section uh, has a total ascent of 4,600 uh, feet. So you kind of know what, what you're getting into. The last thing about gut hooks that is really great is um, real-time comments. Uh, hi other hikers using the app can leave comments for other hikers. And the way this works best is, let's say we're depending on a water source, uh, you know, it's, it's 10 miles ahead. Well, we could see that there's a comment left for that water source saying it's dry. We know that we can't depend on that water source, so we find an alternative source. Um, and that's all I have. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm going to talk about people we met on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, before we started, Greg and I were a little apprehensive about this because we're both um, kind of introverted and we weren't sure if there was anyone that was going to be out there who was our age. We were in our mid-40s when we did this. Um, but we, the typical age of through hikers is two different ages. They're, either in their early 20s, they might have just graduated from college, they might be taking off a year um, before they settle down in a career, and the other age is retirement age. So a lot of people wait till they retire, and they finally have time to take off and go in the woods for six months and hike. Um, however, we did meet a lot of people actually our age, and we made friends with so many people our age, younger than us, older than us, uh, one really great thing about the hiking community is everyone's kind of on an even playing field. There's not a lot of talk about politics, religion. Everyone just has a sole focus of hiking every day. They want to know where the next water source is. They want to know what the weather's like. They want to talk about their injuries and what kind of food they're going to eat in the next town. So that's all we talk about. Um, Another cool thing on the Appalachian Trail is people called trail angels. And in the second picture here, this is a couple who followed us on our YouTube channel. And we didn't know them at all, but they offered us to come into their home and spend a night with them when we were in Pennsylvania. So we did, and it turned out to be great. We probably did this like five or six times with people we didn't even know. And they were just salt of the earth people. They just wanted to help the through hikers. Um, they gave us a homemade meal, a nice bed to sleep in, a nice shower, laundry. They took us to a store to resupply, everything we needed to do. Um, and when trail angels support the trail, they can provide something that's called trail magic. And that is usually food, um, but it can also be like having you into their homes as well. Um, trail magic is usually set up in gaps or parking lots where the trail comes through. And uh, people just come with their car and set up like a cooler or their grill. And I can't tell you how great it is to be hiking in the hot day all day long, just drinking lukewarm water. And you come to this gap and someone's sitting there with a cooler of ice cold Mountain Dews. It's like the best thing ever. It just can totally turn your day around. Um, 
And the last thing I want to talk about people is me and Greg. How did we fare on the trail together? Well, we actually did really good. We still like each other. <laughs> um, we kind of, we had to get used to being with each other 24 hours a day when we quit our jobs and moved to Costa Rica. So we kind of dealt with that then, and there was a transition period because it is a big change. Um, but we got through it and we did great on the trail together. We really helped each other. Like when I was having a bad day, he would pump me up. And when he was having a bad day, I would help him out. And I went to want to hike the trail with anyone else. So I'm glad we're there together. Okay, so Greg's gonna talk about animals. <laughs> By the way, this is not my picture. <laughs> I took it off the internet. Uh, we did see four bear, uh, but they were so fleeting, um, we couldn't take a picture. Uh, so it was surprising to us how few animals we saw. I mean, we were living 24 hours a day for six months in the wilderness, uh, and you would think that we would see just a ton of animals. We, saw, we, we heard quite a few, uh, but maybe because we were hiking as a couple and we were talking as we were hiking, uh, we weren't breathing too heavy, um, we just didn't see very many. But we did see four bear, um, and we saw those in the typical places people see bear in the, the national parks. Uh, we saw ours in the Shenandoah National Park, and then we saw two in New Jersey. It might surprise you, but New Jersey has the highest black bear population in the United States. Uh, most people think of New York and New Jersey as metropolitan areas, uh, but the trail goes through both those states, and I can tell you it's very wild in areas. Um, we also saw uh, four moose, two moose, two, two moose, <coughs> moose, and um, we saw both those in Maine, and once again, they were very far away, and uh, didn't want their picture taken. Uh, this is not very interesting to you guys in, in rapids here, uh, but there are deer everywhere <laughs> along the trail. Um, and once again, in the, in the uh, uh, national parks, they're very tame. Uh, we had uh, stopped for lunch one day, and a, a guy was opening up a sandwich or something, and a deer stalked him. I mean, it came within 10 feet of them, wait, wait, hoping for a handout, I guess. Um, there are snakes. Um, one of the animals that we saw a lot of were snakes. We saw 37. We saw so many that I started keeping track of how many we saw. Uh, I like snakes. I like animals in general. So uh, I was thrilled to see them, except for this first one, the one on the left. Uh, that's a timber rattlesnake. It's a juvenile. It doesn't have rattles on it, so I can't tell you it's there. Uh, Jen stepped right over this because it was laying across the trail, and she thought it was uh, a twig or a stick. Um, and I told her to stop, turn around, and look at what she just stepped over. We Surprisingly, we saw a total of 12 timber rattlesnakes. Uh, some of them notified us of their presence. Uh, some of them lay uh, uh, parallel to the trail and were just deadly quiet. Um, but we didn't have any trouble with any of them. There are two other venomous snakes along the trail. One is the copperhead, and that's found as frequently as the timber rattler, although we didn't see any of those. Uh, the other one is the cottonmouth water moccasin. Uh, it is found in Georgia, the Georgia part of the trail only, and it's very unusual for people to see them because there's not a whole lot of water. Uh, there's a ton of other types of snakes. Uh, one of the most interesting one was this um, eastern hognose snake, which is a brown one. Uh, I touched him with my trekking pole to try to get him out of the, the middle of the trail, and he does what hognose snakes do, which is puff up and hiss. Uh, and I'm told that if I would have pushed him a little bit further, he would have flipped over and stuck out his uh, tongue, playing dead. So, but. I got a show anyway. Um, Jen talked about uh, rodents being a problem for hikers, and they are primarily the chipmunks and the mice uh, that infest the shelters. Um, not only do they want your food, uh, and they'll burrow through your, your backpack to get it, uh, they want nesting material. So a lot of times they'll destroy something and not even touch your food. Uh, you know, people are fearful of bears and snakes. Uh, but really the animal they should fear most on the Appalachian Trail uh, 
is really, really small. It's a tick. Uh, ticks uh, give you Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and a whole bunch of el other ailments. <laughs> and uh, it is the one thing that we protected ourselves against. Uh, we treated all our clothes with uh, uh, permethrin, which is a chemical uh, that kills them. And over six months, we saw three ticks total. So I think it did its job. Um, I'm going to talk about how we changed over our six months on the trail. Um, the most significant changes we found were in our bodies. We obviously became a lot more fit. Um, of course, we were hiking up and down mountains every day, all day long. Uh, we definitely felt this in our legs and our muscles. Um, and we also lost quite a bit of weight. Um, a typical fear hiker needs about six to 8,000 calories, or that's how much they burn each day on the trail. So it's very hard to eat that much food on the trail, especially when we're packing it out and we have to carry it with us. Um, Greg lost a total of 54 pounds. Yep, I and, just found it. <laughs> <laughs> and I lost about 38 pounds. So here you can see us on our first day and our last day, which was day 179. Um, an another thing that changed in us, Greg and I were both pretty confident people before we did the trail, but when we were done and as we were getting closer and closer to the end, we just felt so much more confident um, and just like a, a tip, we really felt like we were a badass. Like, you know, if we could do this, we could do anything. I mean, we really felt that way because we feel like we're just normal people, but we were really determined to do this. We trained for it and we did it. So we felt really good about ourselves. And that leads us to our last day, which was on Mount Katahdin. So we worked 178 days to uh, spend the night to tackle this. This sign is, uh, I guess, the end result of six months of hard work. Um, and Mount Katahdin is no slouch. Uh, it is one of the most difficult um, mountains along the trail. Um, it probably, uh, outside of maybe the Whites in New Hampshire, it is the toughest trail to climb, and this is part of it on our way up. Uh, to give you an idea of, of the severity of this, uh, just look at that last climb. That's five miles worth of basically straight up. You, you gain 4,000 feet in just five miles. Um, so we woke up that, that morning, though, uh, after, uh, it was surreal. Um, a lot of our friends uh, were in the same camp with us, and they, they woke up really early, like 3 o'clock in the morning, to see the sunrise at the top. Um, I can't imagine climbing that mountain um, in the dark, but they did it. Uh, but Jen and I slept in until really late, until 7.30 or so, and uh, ate, a, ate a leisurely breakfast. And the hike itself uh, is almost like a blur. It is very surreal. Um, we had worked so hard to get to this point. Uh, we had trained our bodies every single day for six months. Um, we were fit and we were euphoric and we just flew. We flew up the mountain. Uh, Baxter State Park, where Mount Katahdin is, uh, is very popular and there's a lot of day hikers. And we were just flying past them as we were going up this mountain. Uh, but finally, we hit the uh, sign and uh, all this hard work came to a conclusion, and it was emotional uh, and rewarding uh, and pretty fantastic. So um, we're going to get to some questions shortly, but we first want to tell you real briefly about a book that we wrote together. And writing a book together is... We, as hard as I can eat. It was as hard as I can eat. <laughs> but we did it, um, and it's a book about, it has 100 tips for through hiking the Appalachian Trail. It's um, 100 tips, tricks, traps, or facts. And it can be applied to the Appalachian Trail or really any long distance hiking trail. And Colin is gonna be giving some out as giveaways. And we also have some for sale in the back if you like some. Um, so we just wanted to thank Colin and McMillan Library for having us tonight. Thank you guys for coming out.
Does anybody have any questions? Yes. When, when in the year did you begin and end? We started in 2017. We started March 22nd, and we ended September 17th? 16th. 16th. Uh, you mentioned those little blips and uh, the apps that they have. Do you have cell service up there? Oh, that's a great question. That, that, that was actually part of my notes that I didn't mention. Um, you don't need cell service. Um, we used the same app just recently in Spain on the Camino. We didn't have a cell phone number over there. Works just fine. It works in airplane mode, so it doesn't drain your battery, and you don't need a cell signal or even a cell phone number. Oh, it's just GPS. Yeah, it's just, just pinging off the satellite. Um, you said you guys were blogging. Uh, did you have like a phone charger, like a cell phone Right. We, we said at the beginning we were going to blog, uh, which is writing, uh, and we didn't do that. But we did do daily videos, uh, and we used um, uh, an anchor charger. Uh, it's a battery bank that uh, it's not that big. <laughs> I don't know the specifics of it, but uh, between our two phones, it kept us charged you know, the five or six days we needed before we could get to town to recharge it. Yes, sir. Did you have special shoes for that? That's a great question. Yes. Um, so the typical shoes hikers use are either hiking boots or trail runners. Um, <clears throat> trail runners are kind of the more recent thing hikers are using. and It's a little bit like a tennis shoe, but it's meant to be in the woods on trail and roots and rocks. We both had trail runners. Um, the reason was they're a lot lighter than hiking boots. They dry really quickly, so even if you take water in, which you inevitably do because it's raining a lot and you're walking through creeks and stuff, if you get them wet, they dry out really quickly even while you're wearing them. Um, and what else? We both went through three pairs the whole trail, which typically people go through more than that, but yeah. we got by with three pairs each. Yes? Where did it cost? <laughs> so, so if you're really interested in exactly the cost, um, I did a weekly uh, accounting of how much we spent weekly on our uh, YouTube channel, um, and we'll, we'll mention our, our uh, social media stuff here in a little bit. But um, roughly, uh, they say a thousand dollars per person per month, uh, and that sounds like a lot to be living out in the woods, and it is. However, uh, there's nothing quite like, outside of a cold Mountain Dew, uh, a cold beer in town with a burger <laughs> and uh, some fries. Uh, so, you know, the, the money is spent when you go into town. If you're just living in the woods and you can, you can bypass the towns, you can save a lot of money. But that $1,000 also um, gives you a little bit of a cushion. Um, we had to get off the trail twice because of snowstorms, once in North Carolina uh, and once in Rhone Mountain in Tennessee. Uh, both those times it would have been dangerous for us to be out. So we had to spend, you know, $50, $60 a day for three nights um, to stay at a hostel and to eat food, lots of food. Um, also, your, your gear over six months, something's gonna fail. Uh, something's gonna break or something is going to fail completely or you're gonna find a deficiency in your setup that you didn't know you had. Plus, you could get injured, and uh, that, that might cost money if you have to get a round of antibiotics for Lyme disease or something like that. Yes, sir. Yes. What's the one thing that you wish you had taken along that you could not replace on the trail? A hammer, saw, axe, <laughs> Swiss Army knife? Uh, one thing? One thing that we wanted that we didn't take. Well, we didn't we didn't take coffee. I really I really like coffee. Every morning. <laughs> um, I, I have, think I would agree with that. I would yeah. prefer to have coffee every morning. But it is a process. It takes time to set up your cook stove, get the pots out, do the water, mm -hmm. make the coffee. So we just felt our time could be better spent just getting on the trail right away and hiking. So. It worked well for us, and then when we went into town, we did drink coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and you're, um, you want to be very precise in your gear, uh, because one pound over five million steps really does a number on your body. I mean, it, it really does. It's, it's pounding. Uh, so, 
So we wanted to keep our gear uh, at a certain weight, and, and we were always under that weight. Um, and so we were very particular about what we what we took, and, and I think we were uh, pretty um, cognizant of it when we when we went. So that's why we didn't have very many things that I think we re regret gear wise. Yes, sir. What about food on the trail? What was your go-to food? My go-to food uh, was jerky. It's the one thing that I ate on the trail that, that I never got tired of. Um, I uh, developed an aversion to peanut butter <laughs> and nor rice sides and Idaho and potatoes. Uh, but jerky, I never never got tired of. Um, I really liked Pop-Tarts in the morning, which is something I never eat in normal life. Um, we ate a lot of candy. A sweet tart minis <laughs> were my favorite candy. And also Jolly Ranchers, because you can like, you can suck on a Jolly Rancher for like a half an hour or so. So it kind of, it's kind of a mental game too. Like it was, I don't know, it just kind of helped me when I was having a bad day. Um, what else did I like? I actually ate beef jerky on the trail too. And you never realize. I don't usually eat it. Um, I can't think of, yeah, we ate other stuff too, but that was probably my favorite stuff on the trail. Was there any state that wasn't very well marked? I know uh, Bison's in Pennsylvania one so great. But is there any state that? Uh, New York. I think I, Pennsylvania is tough because uh, it, they call it Rock Sylvania because there's just these boulder strewn fields uh, and it is not as well marked. Uh, but a lot of times they, they mark it some other way with, with big signs. But New York, in New York we had uh, climbed over these big slabs of rocks and they were frequent. Um, and there was not a mark in sight. There was a few times where we got turned around and we had to pull out uh, the application and, and see where we were. Yeah. Yes, sir? Did either of you get sick or injured on this trip? I did. I got sick. I got food poisoning from a Mexican restaurant <laughs> in uh, Virginia. So it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, as, as if I wasn't losing weight fast, um, I, I lost it even faster. But uh, otherwise, we had just general ailments. Our feet always hurt, um, and our knees, and, and things like that. Yes. You mentioned the three pairs of shoes. Did you have them drop shit in some place along the route, or did you probably didn't carry three pairs? Like um, to start I with? think my mom had. Did you have our shoes? Yeah, I think before we left, we had left another pair with her, a new pair. So she sent us the next pair, and then actually somebody gave us trail magic for him. They happened to have his same type of shoe, and said it didn't fit them anymore. Would you like them? And we're like, yeah, send them along. So. They worked great. Did you break them in before you took them? You don't, no, that's another great thing about trail runners. You don't need to break them in. Oh, okay. Yeah, we just got our same size, and they were good to go as soon as we got them. They're really comfortable. Both of our shoes were real comfortable. He had a uh, La Sportiva Wildcats, and I had Solomon, some type of Solomon trail runner. I can't remember the number. That's you can probably buy them along the way, right? If you had them. Yes, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just depends what town you're in. They might have them there or they might not. Yeah, that, that brings up a good point. Uh, you know, one of the things about the Appalachian Trail that was great for us without any experience at all uh, is that it's so well supported. Uh, you're never more than a day and a half from a town. Um, if, if you need something, you can get it. And there are plenty, uh, there's quite the, the trail community uh, and a lot of commerce, so there's always going to be um, outfitters all along the way. And until we got to New Hampshire and Maine, uh, that was not a problem. Maine, uh, there's not much there for support. Uh, but by then, if you're going northbound, uh, you're prepared for just about anything. Yes, ma'am. Did it rain much? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the Appalachian Trail is a very wet trail. You know, there's there's a lot of comparisons that pe people make between the Appalachian Trail on the East Coast and the Pacific Crest Trail, which is in the West. Um, and one of them is the PCT is dry, so dry that water is a concern. AT water, getting water to drink is never a concern. Uh, however, you will get wet. Um, and, and rain is one of the 
hardest things about hiking because rain gear, if it if it um, if it's protecting you from the rain, it means it's stifling you and you're getting wet from sweat. So the, the risk of hypothermia is still there and it's still still something you have to be wary about. How did you know about weather conditions that were particularly threatening you from having to get off yeah. because of snow? Um, good question. Uh, that's something that hikers talk about a lot, so we may have heard that between other hikers. And also, we looked at our phones when we had cell service. We used an app called. <laughs> it's, it's not. It's not in existence anymore. But it was a travel uh, pilot friend of ours who was a hiker told us about it, and it was the most accurate weather we could find on the trail because the trail isn't necessarily in the towns, it's high up in the mountains. So this website we had um, worked really good for time. It was pretty accurate, so, yes. This is from a comment that I maybe uh, picked up on. Have you done that or are you by the other hikes? Uh, we just finished doing the Camino de Santiago, the French route in Spain. That's a 500 mile, um, walk through northern Spain, starts at the French border through the Pyrenees. Uh, we finished that in October. Um, we don't have anything planned for this year. We've been looking at uh, some shorter <laughs> shorter hikes, you know, three, 500 mile type hikes. Uh, yeah, we'll be in Costa Rica for six weeks uh, in a few weeks, and we're gonna do a, a hike to a cave, but that's, you know, just a few miles. Uh, nothing really big on the radar, but we're, uh, I'm constantly dreaming of the next one, uh, and uh, we'll have to um, put it on a spreadsheet for Jen to see if it's doable. <laughs> How many bottles of water do you think you want to do a day? Okay, and, and I know this, this exactly. Uh, one liter per five miles is about what we drink. And we always carry Yeah, we, we carried uh, up to two liters at a time. Yes, sometimes on East, you'll get rain for two, three days, steady. What did you do when that happened? Did you get stay off in your the tent trail? Get off? You know, yeah. that, that's another reason for a, a, a big budget. <laughs> we, we were kind of rain weenies, um, especially, you know, mid, midway to the end. And we were just getting tired. And, and if there was rain in the forecast, if it was 80%, we were off the trail in the hostel. Uh, early on, uh, we would we would stay in our tent and let it rain, um, and, and it, it worked out fine. You know, there there were days. I think ninety percent was the, the the biggest percent chance of rain where it said it was supposed to rain, and it was sunshiny and we didn't see a drop. Then one time it was ten percent and we got drenched. So you never know what what you're going to get, but uh, you're going to be forced to walk through rain. But you're right. Multiple days of rain is, is miserable having wet gear, for sure. Another question about your tents. Um, any problems setting up tents anywhere? I mean, are the designated areas along the way for your tents? Yeah, you want to answer? You want to answer? Okay, uh, yes. So there's there's two two main methods you, you use to select a campsite. One is you go to the shelters. Uh, almost every one of those three-sided shelters has tent spots for for people. Uh, the good part about that is there's usually a water source, there's usually um, bear cables or a bear box to help you with your, your um, food bag. Uh, there's usually a privy uh, and there's usually a lot of other hikers. We tended to like to be alone, um, so we did what was called stealth camping a lot, uh, which is where you find a uh, a campsite that's not at a shelter and it's not in the guidebook. And those up through Vermont, which is the uh, near the end, those are everywhere. You can, you know, there, there are certain regulations in this, the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. You have to stay at the shelters there. Um, excuse me. There are in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, you have to stay at, at their huts or at their campsites, but otherwise you can you can camp wherever you find a, a space. <coughs> Going once. From time to time, 
you hear about someone who did get lost, and I think it was a couple of years ago, a woman who got off the trail, she was by herself, she ended up dying. Yeah. Yes. From your experience, how how could that happen? I mean, carelessness on the camper's part? Yes. Um, it's my understanding that she got disoriented when she went to find a restroom and lost the trail. And then she tried to find her way back and, and got deeper and deeper. And then she fell and hurt herself. And she was having some mental issues anyway. Um, the first thing in her case, I would say, is you should hike with a partner. Or let someone know uh, your hiking plan. Um, we developed, uh, as Jim mentioned, friends all around us who knew what our next day's schedule was going to be. We had each other. Um, you're right, the, the trail the trail is well marked, uh, but things can happen. Uh, you can fall down a, a, you know, a short cliff and hurt yourself and not be able to get out um, or, or knock yourself unconscious. Um, but there, it's very rare, the fatalities uh, on, on the Appalachian Trail. We talked about it. How did you like coordinate with like the care packages you get, not the magic stuff, but like to the post office, post office? So I think that was kind of knowing you guys, following you guys. I thought it was kind of cool how that was coordinated. Yeah. So a few of our friends before we started wanted to send us a care package, which was really nice. Um, however, it was really hard to coordinate because we never really knew like exactly where we were going to be. We, we pretty much only knew what was going to happen the next day and if we got to where we were going or not the next day. So it was very difficult to coordinate that, but um, usually I'd look ahead in our guidebook and try to estimate like within a week where were we going to be at a town that had um, a hostel or a post office and then I'd have them send the care package there. And the post office, you can just put hold for through hiker, and they'll hold it for you. Um, so that worked out pretty well. Except the post office, of course, closes at five and isn't open a lot on Saturdays and Sundays, so that can be a problem. So it, it was difficult, but it was really nice getting care packages. Yes. Too, so it was worth it. Yes. Uh, to and from your beginning and end points, how did you? Oh. So to get there, we actually took a Greyhound bus from here. Wisconsin Rapids to Chattanooga, Tennessee, which was awful. We said we're never going to do that again. <laughs> 23 hours? It was, it was like 23 hours. hours on the bus. Um, and then we had friends who wanted to pick us up in Chattanooga, and they took us to Amicalilla Falls, which was like maybe a three-hour drive. And they spent two nights there with us. There's a lodge there that you can stay in. So that's how we started the trail. And then in the end... <laughs> It, it's difficult. Um, you end in Mount Katahdin, which is like in the middle of nowhere. The closest town was like an hour away. An hour away. Then, then Bangor, which is where you fly out of, is another hour. And yeah. Hour. So I can't remember what. We got we got a ride with someone that was staying at the hostel. We we got to the hostel. We we found a ride um, from Mount Katahdin to the hostel, which is another thing in the hiker community. People hikers hitchhike all the time, and people give you rides. Um, so we did find a ride to the hostel, and then we were going to take a bus to Bangor, um, but we met someone that night in a restaurant whose husband had just come down to help her with her through hike, and they offered us a ride to the airport the next day, so it worked out great. <laughs> but there are, there are shuttle services. If you can't find a free ride, um, there are shuttle services that will take you from the Atlanta airport to the, to the start, uh, or from you know, the, the Bangor Airport to the, to the start if you're going southbound or, or back home. Yes. What percentage of people start the north or south? Is there a reason for doing either or seasonal? Or? Uh, so I would say, and this is this is a guess, but it's, it's probably pretty close, 90% go northbound. Um, the reasons are simple. Um, you basically walk with spring. As you go northbound, uh, you get pleasant weather the whole way. Um, you miss black fly season in Maine, which I hear is maddening. Um, and the reason people go uh, southbound are for, like I mentioned earlier, um, to get a later start because you can't start until June, mid-June. 
um, in, in the earliest, well, there's people already out there now, which is crazy, but most people start in March or April going northbound. Um, so you either want to get a later start um, or you want solitude. Uh, so few people go southbound, um, you, uh, that's the way to go if, if, if you don't want the crowds that are especially ubiquitous in the very beginning, uh, the first two weeks were just were very, very, very crowded. When did you decide to write about it and how did you get published? You want to take? Yeah. So we actually wrote some books when we were in Costa Rica. Um, those were our first books and we wrote about Costa Rica. And we've self-published all our books. Um, so when we started doing the Appalachian Trail, we thought, well, let's take notes on our phone just in case we want to write about it. It might be a good thing to write about. So we did that. Um, and it was really easy when we're, you're hiking all day to think about things. So we would just take notes um, on our phones. And then when we got home, we put it all together and organized it more and started writing about it. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. Explain how you got your trail names. Ah. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> so my trail name, Chica, came from, it's twofold. When we lived in Costa Rica, I had a blog and I wrote a book called Costa Rica Chica. And also Chica means woman. So when we started the Appalachian Trail, I felt it kind of tied me to, to Costa Rica and our life there. And also, I'm really, I was really proud to be a woman hiking the Appalachian Trail because it's uh, very much a, there's more and more women hiking it, but it's a male-dominated field right now. So I was just really proud of myself that I was out there attempting to do it. So that's how my name came about. So mine is actually kind of a play on my last name. And, um, you know, growing up having the last name Seymour, uh, you know, I got my name joked about pretty frequently. Um, there, there's the joke, you know, uh, the guy wrote a book called uh, Under the Bleachers by Seymour Butts, you know, <laughs> things like that. And so, so I wanted to take, take control of my name. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I did. So my, my life goal uh, now, since we left our careers, moved to Costa Rica, hiked the Appalachian Trail, is simply to see more sunsets, to have the time to do the things I want to do. So, sunsets. How are you able to um, continue to travel, and I'm assuming you're not working, how do you continue to fund and finance things? Great question. Um, it's, it's, it's hard. We live very simply. Um, to put things in perspective, our, our out budget in Costa Rica was about $1,200 a month. Um, and we made that. So when we moved to Costa Rica, um, we gave ourselves a, a year, basically, to, to not do anything. And, and neither of us are, are idle people, uh, me, me more so than her. Me, neither of us are super idle. And so in that year, we started doing things that, that we really enjoyed doing, and some of those we were able to monetize, uh, like our books. Um, uh, I actually started writing for a company called International Living uh, Magazine, and that plus the jewelry Jim made plus our books uh, more than covered our expenses in Costa Rica. Uh, we're fortunate to have Jim's mom here in town, and she's, she's let us stay at her house. Uh, in between some of these adventures, uh, so that helps a lot. Um, and and we're still we're still writing our books. Um, we have blogs that make a little bit of money. Jen still does her jewelry um, and, and, and and YouTube. Yeah. So so a lot of little things put together, uh, plus living extremely small, uh, allow us to do this. Done. <laughs> Thank you all.